Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And a very warm welcome to our first talk of 2023. Um, I hope you will join us for a few more during the year. We've got a really varied and interesting uh, program this year. And um, I hope that you will find it in you to come again because this is a wonderful turnout. Um, I've got a few parish notices and then I'll introduce you to Tony King. Um, our new o exhibitions open tomorrow. Um, and those of you who are Terry Pratchett fans or have Terry Pratchett fans in your family, um, we are very privileged to have an exhibition of Paul Kidby's illustrations uh, of the denizens of Discworld. So there are some that have never been shown before. So do come and see them. They're very impressive. And uh, for those of you who didn't know, Paul Kidby lives locally. So he's a great supporter of St. Bart. Uh, and the other exhibition are Polish paper cuts. And I'm not going to attempt to say it in Polish. <laughs> um, but they are beautiful. I went and had a sneak preview today and they are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, they are what the Polish um, women did with sheep shears, can you believe, to decorate their houses um, in place of wallpaper. Um, so they did them every year and then they were taken down and new ones put up and they painted the house in the spring. Uh, but they are absolutely beautiful. And um, the curator is coming um, February to talk uh, in the museum, not here. Um, our next talk for the friends in here, uh, there's a mistake in our program, uh, this program for 2023. Um, it's Friday the 3rd of February, the first Friday, going back to the first Friday. And the other change is that it's at six o'clock, um, just for once because our speaker is coming by train and needs to get back to London that evening. So, uh, and we're very priv privileged to have her because she's the curator um, of the Seen Through Wood exhibition, uh, which will be on just after that talk. So I'll remind you of those two things at the end. Um, so do see the new exhibitions and um, I would like now to welcome Professor Tony King, who is a trustee of St. Barb and was very influential in helping us get the Celtic Horde for the museum. Um, and we also have in the audience tonight one of the detectorists who actually found the Horde. Um, so he's skulking and honestly at the back. <laughs> But it's very exciting for us to have the Horde. And um, Tony uh, knows it intimately, has been involved in the interpretation in the museum. And if you haven't seen it, it's sitting next to the uh, Boulder Horde in the left-hand side of the museum. Um, Tony, do you come and join me. <laughs> Tony is Professor Emeritus of Archaeology from the University of Winchester. And we're very lucky to have him on the board of St. Barb. And he's going to talk to us about our Celtic horde. After a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about the horde, but I'm going to talk about a lot of other things as well. So, in fact, the word Celtic, which is the second word in the title, is going to loom pretty large. Uh, because I want to explore what is Celtic um, and uh, what it means, because we call it the Celtic Horde, but uh, dyed-in-the-wool archaeologists, which I suppose I'm one of, uh, call uh, the coins of this period Late Iron Age, and they avoid the word Celtic. So why have we uh, used Celtic for the title in the museum, and what does it mean? Well, let's start with a bit of audience engagement. Who, hands up those of you who feel you've got Celtic identity or origins. <laughs> right, quite a few of you. <laughs> That's interesting. And presumably that means Scotland, Wales, Ireland, maybe Cornwall, maybe Brittany. 
Anywhere else? Isle of Man, perhaps? Oh. Well, that's what we regard of today as being Celtic uh, identity, Celtic heritage. Now, let's have a look at a map. Mm -hmm. This is good to work. Has it failed? Yes. Well, the map showing the people that we've just talked about, and those of you who put your hands up, you are the green grouping up the top here in this map, showing what's sometimes called the Celtic fringe, which is a rather disparaging term. Um, but if we go back to the Iron Age, before the Roman conquest, those two maps underneath it show where Celtic language was probably spoken and where we might be able to identify uh, people who call themselves Celts. And what you can see here is a big area covering, well, Britain, France, Germany, into the Balkans, uh, over to Ukraine, down into Spain, into Turkey, a big, big area. And um, it wasn't solidly Celtic, as it were, and there were people who were speaking Celtic in that area, but not, not, not uh, uh, the majority. And this is the Celtic heartland. The area here, which is in yellow, is actually in southern Germany and eastern France. And that's where uh, the art style that we'll come on to, that uh, we call Celtic, first developed. And it spread out from there in the Hauschtat and Laten period into the sort of red area on that lower map. And we have a large Spanish area. Um, and we have Britain and going, of course, down into uh, the mouth of the Danube and the Black Sea and that sort of thing. So it was much, much bigger at one point. And um, we have some places called Kelty. I actually dug at a place called Kelty. C-E-L-T-I, which is near Seville. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, a, a group of people calling themselves the Celts are down here in southern Spain. Um, the Romans tended to call the Celts the Gauls or the Galatae or something like that. Um, and it, there's quite a lot of different names. So the word Celt is a little bit difficult. It's quite an interesting one. So I'll come back to the language in a moment because language is really interesting and we'll discover that somewhere quite a few places around here are actually Celtic place names. So, hmm. yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, but before we do that, let's have a quick look at genetics. Now, a very important paper has just been published in the journal Nature, which is one of the most prestigious scientific journals in Britain, or in the world, in fact. And this came out in November, and uh, what it has, amongst other things, is quite a lot on uh, identity of the period after, during and after Roman, Roman period. Who is Saxon? Who is Germanic? And that sort of thing. And if we look at these two maps, we'll see something else going on here. Uh, WBI means Western Britain and Irish. CNE means Central and Northern European. And these are genetic groupings. And what the map on the left shows is that in the period just after the Roman conquest, uh, sorry, just after the Romans left and we get the Saxons coming in, by uh, a couple of centuries later, we have a genetic situation where the majority in the south and east are in the red area, which is um, tending towards CNE. In other words, for people coming in who are called you know, the, Ang the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, and so on, who are coming in after the Roman period. They're not Celts, of course, but the Western British and Irish might well be. <laughs> And these people in Ireland, in Wales, in Scotland, lesser extent in Cornwall, 
correspond with what happened later with the people in the audience here tonight put your hands up, that's probably the areas that you're coming from. Um, and uh, there seems to be a genetic divide that happens after the Romans left Britain. But I haven't talked about a map on the right, <laughs> because the map on the right is rather more interesting in some respects. The green area on the map is Fran French Iron Age. Um, genetic sequencing. And there is quite a large area in the south of Britain, south and east of Britain, including here, of course, which uh, has got uh, genetic evidence which seems to suggest that there were people coming in probably before the Roman conquest who had um, French or continental Iron Age uh, genetic sequencing and that sort of thing. And in other words, we seem to have a situation that there is a group, of, a group of people in Britain, still there today, who may be uh, Germanic, i.e. the red area, uh, the Western British and Irish, WBI, which is the sort of the blue area, Celts maybe. That's the same on this other map, but the, the green is the Celtic substratum of the people who were here before Roman conquest. In other words, th this relates to the ancient DNA, in other words, skeletons and that sort of thing, but it also relates to what's called mitochondrial DNA, which is traced back from present day populations. And what you can see there is there's clearly quite a lot of Celtic evidence, or French Iron Age, maybe Celtic, um, in Britain, and it still survives today. So, with bearing that in mind, <laughs> let's go on to the language. I think I'm going to have the next slide, please. Um, and quick background in languages. In Europe, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'll be teaching some people to suck eggs in all of this, but let's... <laughs> uh, in Europe, of course, there are quite a few languages which are very closely related to each other, as we'll see in a moment. Um, they are, generally speaking, in a group of languages called Indo-European, and that includes, of course, Celtic. It includes Pictish, which used to be thought of as non-Indo-European, and that's in Scotland, but is now regarded as related to Celtic. Um, things change in languages, study of ancient languages, I have to say. And then we have Teutonic, which is the generalized word for German, Scandinavian languages, and also Dutch, and so on, and English, of course. Um, and we have Balto Slav, which is, includes Russian, Polish, uh, Czech, and so on. And we have, then have Greek, Latin, and if you go a little bit further east, you get Persian, and indeed to India, Sanskrit. They're all related together. Um, in amongst all that lot, there are some groups of people who speak other languages, which are not related, of which the most interesting by far is Basque, because it looks as though that's an original population that was here before any people speaking Indo-European languages got into Europe. And, they are, and Basque is an original language of Europe. It's really interesting. Same might apply to Etruscan, which of course has disappeared as a language. Um, well, as you can see, that's very interesting. And if we go to the next slide, please, this extraordinary map uh, showing a globe with some languages on it, um, the Celtic fringe, as it were, is just about visible as the, uh, on the edges here. But this is basically Germanic, Teutonic, this is Romance languages, Greek, and so on, uh, Balto Slav, and then Persian and Sanskrit, and all the rest of it. Gives some indication of where the languages are spoken. Okay, let's have the next one, please. And just to demonstrate how it all relates together, uh, if you take a Germanic language, which is English, uh, Celtic, which is Irish, then Latin and Russian, which is Balto-Slav, of course. 
Look at one, two, and three. You can see the obvious connection between those first three numbers in each of those languages. Um, they, they are very similar to each other. But Ixi, Caxi, and Colmi clearly is rather different. Now, I, <laughs> I can't speak Finnish, and I have no uh, knowledge of Finnish at all, but clearly, it, and it's not an Indo-European language. Well, what, what, what do we draw out of this? One of the things is that when Julius Caesar got to uh, conquer Gaul, he talked about Celts, and he said that they spoke their own language and all the rest of it, and he said that Germans spoke another language um, and had different customs and so on. Then he had a third group of people, the Belgic peoples, who um, are roughly speaking in northern France, and of course the place that is today Belgium, which takes its name from the Belgic peoples. And it's clear that he said that the languages were related, but the Belgic, languages, Belgic language might have some Germanic elements in it. And there the people that, in part, came over to Britain right at the end of the Iron Age. So there's just a possibility, and it's quite a debating point amongst uh, specialists at the moment, is whether the language spoken in southern Britain at the time of Roman conquest was not truly what you might call Celtic of the sort of purist sort, but was a, a mixture, a hybrid between uh, Celtic and Germanic. And it's, uh, so that's an interesting one. Um, and obviously languages do change, languages develop, and that sort of thing. So let's go back, have the next one please. Let's go back to Celtic and have a quick look at it in terms of language, because it does appear on some of the coins. Uh, to get, the other thing to say is that Celtic language is very similar to Latin in many respects, which is uh, uh, another complicating factor. But the Celtic languages that we know of are common Celtic, which is the original one, um, and then uh, the one that spoke, was spoken really widely right up until the 3rd or 4th century AD, well into the Roman period. Um, that's Gaulish. And then on this side of the English Channel, we've got British or Brythonic, and that's got various subdivisions, Pictish in Scotland, Cumbric in Cumbria, Welsh, Cornish, and Cornish and Welsh go over into Brittany to create Breton. Um, and then we have the Irish for, uh, side of the, uh, of the British Isles with Irish, Scots, Gaelic, and Manx. Um, so, what's on the picture? Well, that's a Celtic inscription, one of the very, very few that we've got. We tended not to write things down, um, and it's only on the coins and on the very rare inscriptions that we actually get anything written down from the Iron Age in Celtic. And that's from central France, uh, and it's written in Latin script, but in Celtic language. So if we have the next slide, we've got translation. Um, and I hesitate to try and pronounce it, but let's have a go at reading it out. Martialis Danatali Yuru Ukueti Sosin Kelic Non Etic Gabedbi Dugeontio Ukuetin in Alasia. The last word <laughs> is the one which might re ring a bell with some of you. If you've read your Julius Caesar's Gallic War, Alesia is in 52 BC, was where Vercingetorix was defeated and Gaul finally, as it were, surrendered to the Romans. And uh, the town wasn't destroyed, it carried on, and lo and behold, it has a Roman period temple in it, to the god Ucuatus, and um, this is the inscription in Celtic from the first or second century AD. Um, so we carried on speaking a language and they carried on with a few inscriptions as well. Okay, we have, um, let's move on two slides actually, I'll forget about the next one, yes. Right, 
Let's bring in another element in all of this, in this Celtic background, because this is really interesting. Um, place names. Now, place names, equally to discussion of language, play, the study of place names actually is constantly changing. Um, there used to be a very strong stream of interpretation saying that pretty much all the place names in southern Britain were, were Anglo-Saxon or Germanic in origin. Um, very few of them were, were not, apart from river, some river names. We'll come on to those in a moment. But what have we got here? Here are some places which have got Celtic names to them, and were, we know their names in the, in the Roman period. So the, the ancient name for Colchester is Camulodunum. And Camulodunum is, Camulos is a god of war, and Dunum means a fortress. Um, and that's interesting. It's probably its name before the Roman conquest, and then the Romans turned up, and they kept the name. Chelmsford, though, um, is interesting because it's called Caesaromagus. And Caesar refers to uh, the emperor. So this is a name that was created after the Roman conquest in Celtic. Um, and magus means a marketplace. Um, let's go on briefly. Aquae Sulis. Well, that's a Latin name. Um, Aquae means water. Sulis means um, the baths of the goddess Sulis, who's, who's uh, equivalent of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. Um, so you can see you sometimes get mixtures of Latin and Celtic on, in the same name. Um, the Thames, word whose name we, we don't really know its meaning. It might even be pre-Celtic, um, but that's... Uh, a lot of river names are, uh, uh, have Celtic origins to them. And then there's the word for water, which is most obvious in the word name Do Dover, which in Latin, uh, sorry, in Roman times was Dubris. And it comes, you can see the, uh, the Cornish and the Welsh origins there, or, or derivatives there, Dofer and Duffer. Um, and uh, so you can see the link there. Um, and there are other places which are a bit less obvious. Uh, a couple in London, Brent means a high place. Penge, uh, which means uh, the, head of the head of the wood. And we can derive them from Celtic etymologies of one sort or another. So are, they, are these, these people who were green <laughs> on the genetic map, are they still there? Are their names been surviving, despite the fact that most people are speaking English? Um, so that's quite an interesting one. Um, various places like Cotswolds uh, might be derived from a, a god name or a goddess name, Kuda, which is the equivalent of a dove. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's got a Celtic first bit and a a Germanic or Saxon second bit to it. So wold is, the, is a Saxon word. And a lot of big places like London and Paris and Milan and so on um, retain names from really early times. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of them got Celtic origins to them. Milan, for instance, was called Mediolanum, and that means in the middle of the plain. Um, so, can we have the next slide, please? Let's get a bit more local, because this is when it gets more interesting. Um, Winchester. Well, Winton, Wintoncester, uh, as it was, that's what Bede calls it in the uh, early Middle Ages. Um, in the Roman period, it was called Venta Belgarum. The vent bit, which means marketplace or something of that sort, um, is the bit that survives as win in Winchester, as far as we can tell. And um, we know that there was a big open-air market area within Winchester, right next to the station at a place called Orham's Arbour. And the tribal bit, which I will be coming back to when we look at the coins, um, is uh, the, Bel the Belgi, these people who give their name to present-day Belgium. 
Let's have a look at a river name, Mion. Now, the River Mian and the Mian Valley, I've, I've been doing quite a lot of work there, which hence it's on, on the slide here. Um, and it might be derived from a goddess name, but we've had to restore it, hence the asterisk at the beginning. That's a restored name. It, it, we haven't got any clear, definite evidence for its existence, so it's a bit of a guess. So Mayana or Mayana, a lot of uh, river names N have O-N in them, or um, and Avon is the obvious example, um, but uh, quite a lot of others do as well. And uh, uh, this is a deity name, which is quite interesting. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? But let's get a little bit more local. Pennington. I guess quite a few of you here may come from Pennington or Limington, uh, <laughs> since you, I guess, you very well have walked here. Um, if you look at the uh, Oxford uh, book on place names of Britain, it says Pennington is farmstead playing, paying a penny rent. Um, and that's derived from a 12th century spelling. The earliest known spelling of a place is Pennyton. Um, but, of course, we've seen Penge and P E N. -N um, which is a pretty common name, it means a headland or a hill or a high place or something like that. Now, Pennington isn't that high, I would hasten to say, <laughs> but um, it may be, and only just maybe, that it's actually got a combined Celtic first element and uh, Germanic or Saxon second and third elements, the ington bit at the end. Livington's much more clear cut, actually. And it's really interesting um, because Limen is a river name and it's a, it's a pre-Germanic river name of one sort or another. The two possibilities here, a uh, river with elms along it or a marshy river. And um, I know we probably haven't got any elms along it today <laughs> because the elms have all disappeared, but uh, it could easily be a marshy river without any doubt. Um, and there's a place in Bromley Marsh called Lim, um, and uh, Limoges in France, they're all the same initial element. So we could have a twinning thing with Limoges, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Uh, a <laughs> um, couple of other names, Solent. There's a recently published article in the Hampshire Studies which suggests that Solent is derived from a Latin word, solvo, which means to weigh anchor. In other words, it's an anchorage or something like that. And that, again, might be, because Latin and Celtic are fairly closely related, again, that might go back to the uh, pre-Roman pre period. But it's, it's almost certainly a Roman, at least a Roman place name, could be an earlier place name too. Uh, Avon, now Avon, is possibly the best known example of a Celtic name meaning a river. So if you say the Avon River, you, you're saying river, river, basically. Um, and we've got two Avons in our area. We've got the Avon Water, which runs through Sway and down to Key Haven. Um, and we have the much bigger River Avon, which is currently flooding, of course, in Ringwood and uh, Fording Bridge and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, these are important uh, river routes into the interior of the south of, south of England, into Salisbury Plain and that sort of area. The one that you think might ought to be Celtic, <laughs> perhaps, um, is Hengisbury Head. Now, if you know the archaeology of this area, Hengisbury's got definite evidence for Iron Age occupation. It was here at precisely the time when some of these Celtic names were being developed and all the rest of it. But the name Hengisbury is pretty modern. Um, and its earliest known name is, as spelt there, is Head Hedensbury. Um, and possibly it's actually a Viking name. So it's not one that we can actually, we can derive from the, uh, from the uh, uh, pre-Roman world. So, very interesting, I think. And if you have the next slide, please. Let's now get on to coins. <laughs> Long last. Um, 
Now, the coins are being produced, largely speaking, by the people of Gaul and by that long spread in the Celtic world that goes across the Alps and down into the Balkans and so on. And the earliest coins um, outside the Greek and Roman world were being produced in the Balkans, actually, in the 4th, century, 4th and 3rd century BC. And they were gradually spreading as a system of currency uh, around the top, uh, north side of the Alps, into southern Germany, into France, and then ultimately into Britain. They get to Britain about 150 BC, something like that. And they tend, at first, to be imports. So this is a coin of the Parisii, um, and is a coin, um, the Parisii, of course, are Paris, um, that sort of region. Um, although there's another lot of Parisii in East Yorkshire as well. <laughs> um, and they do, uh, there is a migration pattern, and there seems to be a split so that some stay in, in France and some go to Yorkshire. Um, and here you can see a pretty typical, um, a rather good Iron Age coin. Uh, it's, you can see the face, you can see hair, um, and that sort of thing. And you can see a horse, which is a very common design on the obverse on the other side. Uh, sorry, the river, reverse, not the obverse. Um, here is possibly the sun underneath, and that's, these are moons or stars or something like that in the sky. And it's got a cosmological interpretation to it. And if we have the next slide, please. A lot of these coins have similar designs. Here are some more. Oh, this is a common way of, of, of showing them as a, a sort of like a, a, a rubbing, as it were. Here's the head um, of a Parisian. Here's um, another Parisian state of a sort. In fact, it's a coin we've just seen. Uh, here's one from Brittany, but with a, a horse with a human head on it. Um, and a sort of winged person here. These are almost certainly gods of some sort. And uh, this also, if you're Sismii, are also from northern France. Um, and we'll come back to this one because what you can see, if you look carefully at it, this is a head, and there's some much smaller heads here, here, and here. And take my word for it, that is a wild boar. Um, uh, <laughs> And uh, these heads are attached by chains or ropes to the head of the god who's the main person depicted here. These are human severed heads. Um, now, I'll come back to that. <laughs> An interesting issue there. Um, okay, next slide, please. And a lot of the coins... Um, get gradually more and more uh, stylized. And here we have a coin, as I say, from, of about 150 BC, imported from northern France, ends up in Fenny Stratford, which I think is in Buckinghamshire, if I remember rightly. Um, and uh, here we can see a head, but a vast mass of hair. This is a, a diadem of some sort there. Um, and here we have the horse, the sun. Uh, this, take my word for it, this is a boat on this side here. And these are the dots of the moon and various other cosmological symbols. Now, our coins in our hoard, uh, just over the road, have got a lot which look very much like this, but much more stylized. And they've got the same design on them. Um, but they're 100 years later roughly speaking. Okay, next slide, please. Biocassis, um, Cherbourg, and that sort of area uh, in northern France. So pretty close to here, really. Um, and here we have the chain, what looks like a skull, a thing that looks rather more like a wild boar. <laughs> um, you can see the crest along the back and its uh, tusks and that sort of thing. Um, and that's a, a probably a military symbol, a, a, a standard of some sort for a warrior. Okay, next slide, please. And 
Here we have, uh, when we get into ones which are actually being produced in Britain, um, some are very interesting, and I, don't, I could spend a long time talking about different designs on coins. There are about 3,000 different types of coin, by the way, being produced in the Iron Age. If we went through them all one by one, I think we'd... Uh, <laughs> you'll, just, you'll all have been lying on the floor groaning. <laughs> um, so we're not going to look at very many of them. You'll be glad to know. Um, but this sort of uh, cross-shaped design with uh, uh, swirls in it and that sort of thing... Um, that seems to relate to some sort of reef, or uh, it might be heraldic. But we think that some of these coins represent symbols of belonging to a particular group of people. And on the other side, we have a horse, quite a nice horse, actually, uh, well, uh, well depicted. You actually see that it's a horse rather than a series of funny lines with, with uh, dots in between them. You can see someone uh, on the back, and you can see this thing, which is a Celtic or an Iron Age trumpet called a carnix with uh, a dragon's head type of, or horse's head type of uh, uh, mouth, uh, end piece to it. Um, and these are war trumpets. So there is a military aspect to these coins, which is quite interesting. Okay, next slide, please. Well, they also come in hordes, as we know. <laughs> we, we've got the, the, the horde or the double horde from... Uh, that is now on display. This is one from Somerset, which is actually on display um, in the British Museum. Um, and these coins are quite interesting because they haven't got anything on one side. They are gold coins which are just shiny on one side. Sometimes they have little bits of lettering on them, like a letter A or something like that. Um, and the, the coins which are... Uh, blank on one side, are thought to be are meant to reflect the sun, but we don't know for sure. The design is all on the other side. And as time goes on, the coins start to, uh, well, the, the peoples in southern Britain start to get in contact with the Romans quite extensively, and the coins have to have some sort of equivalence. If they're actually going to use them for trading, then they need to have some sort of equivalence. So they start to settle down by the time we get to the first century AD, before the Roman conquest, and um, the coins start to imitate Roman ones and be um, fractions or multiples of Roman coins in terms of weight and that sort of thing. Um, and this is one produced not too long before the Roman conquest in 43 AD. Here we have Epilus, who is fairly local, um, come from the Chichester uh, Hampshire over to Winchester sort of area, but probably not this particular area in the New Forest. And these are copies of Roman designs on the very latest ones, which are coming out just before Roman conquest. Okay, next slide, please. Well, what are these coins used for? Now, when I talked about this before, which was probably this time last year, as I, I'm sure I said, but you, couldn't, you can't buy a loaf of bread with one of these coins and get change. They're far too valuable. Um, and uh, a single coin, a gold coin probably, might be worth a whole amphora, that's several gallons of wine. Um, it might be worth a whole cow or something like that. So they are basically storage of wealth, a bullion and that sort of thing, it's particularly the gold and silver ones. Um, and there's also a very strong religious element to these coins as well. Uh, there's a, the notion that a, the coins are issued by a, a group of people, a tribe or a people or nation or whatever. They called themselves, well, the Romans called them nationes, nations, by the way, not tribes. <laughs> um, so uh, the, probably they had a sense of belonging a group of gods that went with each group of people and therefore um, the coins had a religious aspect to them and sometimes to pick the gods, as we've just seen. And a lot of these coins are deposited in uh, contexts which are definitely associated with religious sites. Bath is the most obvious. Hopefully you've all been to Bath. And if, you've, if you've never been to Bath, do try and go there. <laughs> um, and... Uh, uh, here is the spring. Um, 
looking a little bit sort of from, well, not too wonderful, uh, or this is one, actually it's one of the bars rather than the central spring uh, for bathing pools. Uh, but at Bath, we have 12,000 coins deposited into the spring. So the water that bubbles up through the spring that you can drink <laughs> um, comes up through a load of Iron Age coins, amongst other things. Um, and uh, uh, they aren't all Iron Age by any means. In fact, the Iron Age coins are distinctly rare at Bath. Um, they're mainly Roman coins. But what's interesting at Bath, if we can have the next slide, please, is this is the overall plan of Bath showing the temple in black there, the spring with the place where all the coins uh, and other bits and pieces like cursed tablets and so on were deposited here. Now, what came first and what was originally here was the spring, because that's a natural uh, natural thing. It's, it's not, in, not being moved by people in any way. Um, so the temple is definitely positioned so that it's in a specific relationship to, the, to where, the coin, uh, where all the deposits are found. Same goes for a site in Surrey near uh, between Farnham and Guildford called Wanborough, uh, where we've got a big deposit of Iron Age coins and then uh, a circular temple. Um, and there, it's got the same relationship. And next slide, please. Same at Hailing Island, which is a site I've been involved with for a very long period of time. Um, and we're still doing work there. In fact, we were out there last weekend uh, looking for, with metal detectorists, uh, looking for uh, coins and <laughs> other things. Here is the distribution of coins and the temple itself. Um, in other words, uh, there's... Clearly, people deposited coins at temple sites. Um, and uh, a lot of archaeologists now think that the majority of the coins that we find, which are so-called Celtic coins, somehow have some sort of religious context to them. Um, let's have a look at some of the coins from Hailing Island just for a moment. And next slide. Here we have uh, what is now familiar to you. Here's a god. Uh, chains coming out the top of its head, severed heads on the top, that sort of thing. That's an import from Gaul. Here we have a local coin, triple-tailed horse, so-called. Um, uh, and here we have a, a coin just before the Roman conquest uh, with a bird with a bunch of grapes, which is quite interesting because grapes are not grown in Britain at this particular time. At least we don't think so. And then we have a Roman coin, which got here before the, Roman con before the Roman conquest. It's coin of Augustus, and it's been deliberately damaged. It has, uh, you can just about make out a big slash across it there, across the, the head and face of the emperor. And it's mainly from religious sites in the Iron Age that you get damaged and defaced coins. So they're destroying them um, before offering them to the gods. OK, well, let's get on to Nurse uh, the, the Hoard. Now, I can say, that because it's been published, that it's from Nursling, if you wanted to know exactly where it's from. So next slide, please. Oh, hang on, just before we get there. Some coin, uh, coins from... Uh, yeah, can I have the next slide, please? Yes. Uh, some coins uh, do depict gods. Here's the horned god, Kernanos. This is one from Petersfield in Hampshire. Um, and uh, here are depictions of the uh, horned god and, and indeed goddess from the Roman period. But let's get on to our hoard. It's in the museum in St. Barb. Um, as I say, we can, it's been published um, in British Numismatic Journal. Uh, we're not saying exactly where it comes from, but it is from Nursling. Um, and what we've got, recognisably from what I've just been saying, is uh, the head and the, the, the hairstyle, the diadem, um, and the horse, and the dots, and the sun, and the boat, and all the rest of it. But as I say, these are 100 years later than the, the, the good example I showed you earlier on. And they're getting a little bit 
degraded in style or changing their style by this time. This is the only gold coin. It's a so-called Chute stator. Chute is near Andover, where a hoard of these coins was found. And uh, these are ones from Dorset. These are so-called Diratrigan coins. The vast majority of all the coins from the, the hoard um, actually come, uh, are of this type. And uh, uh, there's been a detailed study in the publication that, that's, that's come out in the British Numismatic Journal um, looking at the, the dye linkages and all the rest of it, which is the sort of thing that numismatists love to do. Um, and we'll come back to some of their findings very shortly. So a good 80% plus are this type of coin and seem to link with Dorset. They also link with the Isle of Wight, as we'll see shortly. These are smaller coins, are ones from further east, mainly from some of the so-called Danebury series of coins, and those coins are, um, well, found around Danebury. Danebury's an interesting place. Ho hopefully you've all been to Danebury as well, because that's the, the, the best Iron Age hill fort around here. Uh, it's near Stockbridge. Um, <coughs> and um, it's a good place to go for a walk. But it was abandoned as a place uh, in the Iron Age by about 100 BC. But large quantities of coins like these are being produced later on. So something is going on at Danbury which we don't understand, uh, continuing to produce coins somewhere in the area. Um, and they have Eastern coins as well, which is this one here. And they're quite late coins which look a bit sort of scrubby in design by comparison with the, uh, the other ones. Uh, this has got a, a bull's head on it and can be related to a period just before the Roman conquest. Um, I won't go into detail about all the coins, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but let's have a look at the next slide. The hoard is part of a group of, of, of hoards which are all of these dots. Um, R1 is sort of round there, um, which are in central southern England and the Isle of Wight, Hampshire, all that sort of area. Um, and they date to a period around 50, 40 BC after the Roman conquest of Gaul and at the time when uh, tribute was being demanded of the Britons because Caesar had come over to Britain, had asked for tribute, they started to pay it, the gold coin, the chute stator, which I sh showed on the previous slide, was probably minted in order to give to Julius Caesar and his successors, but he never got there. Um, and uh, a lot of these hoards are being deposited around that time in this, and it's quite a good distribution of, of coins uh, in this area. Um, and uh, if we look at the next slide, the Diratrigan coins um, tend to spread further west and are, go later in date as well. That's all the red ones here. Um, the Isle of Wight is, has got a vast number of Iron Age coins from it. Uh, Isle of Wight's a really interesting place. This um, illustration is taken from a book that was published in January this year. In other words, only a couple of weeks ago. Um, and... Uh, uh, by David Tomalin called Roman Vectis. So if you're interested in the Isle of Wight, that's well worth trying to get hold of. Um, but uh, it's a bit blank around here, um, and he doesn't know about nursling, so he doesn't mark it on the map, actually. Uh, but uh, 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 here you can see possible Belgae, the Atrobates in the east. These people who were probably the Vectuarii, um, the people of Vectis, uh, the Isle of Wight, and they are linked very closely in terms of the coins to the Duratrigues, who give their name to Dorset. So the, the New Forest is sort of in between different groupings, the Isle of Wight, Dorset, um, Hampshire on the eastern side of Southampton Water, and so on. Um, and this place, Nursling, almost certainly was a market or something for exchange between these different groups. And it's probably really important in the, in the Iron Age and Roman period. The 
the, the closest parallel to uh, our Hoard, in fact, uh, our Hoard Museum here. In fact, the, the one that is actually pretty close on the other side of the, uh, of the Solent is from Brystone on the Isle of Wight. Um, and that has a lot of similar coins to the ones that we've got on display over the road. Um, unfortunately, the Brystone Hoard was disclaimed by uh, the Treasury at the time that it was found, and it was all sold um, to hundreds of different people, so it can never be reconstituted. And that's one of the wonderful things that's happened about our hoard, is that we've got it all in one piece, and it's all on display. And that's really, really significant. So, next slide, please. Um, the analysis of the hoard uh, by John Talbot and Eleanor Gay um, suggested, in fact, that they're two hoards. In fact, they're two groups of coins, seven metres apart from in, in the ground, found on successive days. Um, and uh, the first hoard, uh, the, the linkages, the, the, as it were, the, the relatives of the coins from the first hoard are all in Dorset, particularly in this area around Bad, Badbury, uh, Badbury Rings and that sort of thing, Wimborne, that sort of area. Um, the second hoard, which slightly fewer, num fewer coins slightly later in date, actually comes from further north, from the Salisbury area uh, and in Wiltshire. So all its relatives, in terms of dye linkages, are, are elsewhere. So actually, what you're looking at when you go to a museum are two different hoards found very close together, maybe 10 years apart in date, and deriving in terms of their composition from slightly different areas. And it looks as though, um, here's, here's Nursling, um, this is the boundary zone, which was in the Deiratrigan area in the, in the New Forest, including Lymington, of course, and Buckland Rings and everything like that. And then perhaps we get an influx of, uh, of people who ultimately call themselves the Belgar and give their name to Winchester, which is just here. Um, and uh, the boundary of Dorset then, uh, and the Dura Tree Gates then ends up where it is today, um, on the River Avon and, and that area a bit further to the, to the west. So, next slide, please. Um, take out the word sub Duratriges and put in perhaps Belgae or indeed even Vectuarii. That's what we're talking about. This is what we end up with just at a time just before the Roman conquest. Whereas previously the Duratriges looked as though they come over to Tatchbury and into Southampton Water uh, and, uh, and include, the, uh, include the new forest in the area. It's a little bit, con you know, we don't know for sure, but that's what the coins seem to be suggesting. And who are these Belgae? Well, next slide, please. These are the people who come in the wake of Commius crossing the channel after the, uh, Caesar's conquest of Gaul. He comes over to this area here, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, he has the name of the Atrobates, which is a, a tribal name on both sides of the English Channel, um, like a Parisi. Uh, but the Atrobates exist in Hampshire and Berkshire and West Sussex and bits of Surrey and that sort of area. Um, so that's what we have here, uh, possibly as a result of Commius. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on that. What I want to finish up with is a quick whiz through, really. Who were the people? What were they like um, who had these coins and so on? So next slide, please. Some of them were clearly warriors. There's a warrior burial from Adenac Industrial Park near Nursling um, with a sword and all that sort of thing. Um, there's a, a wonderful Iron Age warrior burial from Bogna Regis, which is what you can see on the colored parts of this slide on the right-hand side, um, with a, an extraordinary helmet, which is on display in, in Chichester Museum. Um, so maybe these are the sorts of people who were fighting against the Romans, who were employed as mercenaries by the Gauls in the, the, the battle against Julius Caesar in the 50s BC, and so on. 
And we also have a lot of literary evidence as well about what was going on, not just archaeology. So next slide, please. Um, we have evidence for chariots. We have evidence for warriors and so on. And at this point, I'm going to read a few extracts from the ancient sources. Um, Romans and the Greeks loved to write ethnographies. They loved to sort of have descriptions of people they regarded as inferior, basically. Um, and uh, they called them barbarians, of course. Barbarian in Greek means people who go bar, 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 and don't know how to speak properly. So it's a bit of an insult, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but Julius Caesar, uh, he was there at first hand, and so were quite a few other people, particularly someone called Posidonius, um, but also Diodorus Siculus and Athenaeus and Strabo and a couple of others. Um, so let's read uh, some of these. I, I won't read them all because there isn't time. Um, this is Caesar, writing in the uh, 50s BC. In all of Gaul, there are two classes of men who are of some rank and honour. But the common people are held almost in the condition of slaves who dare nothing by themselves and none are treated in, a, uh, treated in an assembly. In other words, they don't have a voice. Very many of them, hard-pressed by debt or extensive taxes or powerful injustice, give themselves up in servitude to the nobility. In them are all the same rights which masters have over slaves. But the other two classes are first the Druids, who are the priests, and second, the warriors with horses, like this person, <laughs> and, or the person who was buried at Bognor Regis, and so on. Okay, what does Diodorus Siculus say? Round about, he's writing about the same sort of time. They mainly talk about the Gauls, but we'll come on to the Britons. The Gauls are terrifying in appearance and speak with deep, harsh voices. They speak together in few words, using riddles, which leave much of the true meaning to be un understood by the listener. They frequently exaggerate their claims to raise their own status and diminish others. They are beautiful, violent, and melodramatic, but very intelligent and learn quickly. Sort of patronizing type of <laughs> view. Um, but what arises in the ancient writers is, very quickly, they develop a, a series of um, what are called topoi, um, features of how the language, uh, 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 cliches effectively, of what they think the Celts are all about. Another part of the appearance is their hair. Gauls are very tall with white skin and blonde hair, not only blonde by nature, but more so by the artificial means they use to lighten their hair. This is the men they're talking about. For they continually wash their hair in a lime solution combing it back from the forehead to the back of the neck. This process makes them resemble satires and pan, since this treatment makes the hair thick like a horse's mane. Hence that a reconstruction there. And um, Diodorus goes on. Gauls wear stunning clothing, shirts which have been dyed in various colours and trousers which they call brachi, which we get our word breeches from. They also wear striped cloaks with a a uh, checkered pattern. You have the next slide, please. And thick in winter and thin in summer, fastened with a clasp. They use uniquely decorated man-high shields, some with projecting bronze animals of superb workmanship. Uh, and so on. On their wrists and arms, they wear bracelets, and on their necks, fixed band, thick bands of solid gold. The Celts of the interior of Gaul, this is, and all, actually also of Britain, have a peculiar custom concerning the sacred places of their gods. Large amounts of gold are openly displayed in dedication to the gods. No one dares to touch these sacred de deposits, even for the Celts from especially covetous people. Um, there's a lot about fighting, um, <laughs> as you might expect. Uh, a little snippet, we get our word lance, as in the, uh, the weapon, it's, that's a Celtic word. Um, so there are quite a lot of interesting things that come out of this. Feasting's another issue. They eat only small amounts of bread, but large quantities of meat, either boiled, roasted, or cooked on spits. They, do, they dine on this 
in a clean but leonine manner, holding up whole joints with both hands and biting the meat off the bone. If a piece of meat is too difficult to tear off, they cut it with a small knife. When a number of them dine together, they sit in a circle with the most powerful man in the centre, like a chorus leader. Beside him sit the remainder of the dinner guests in descending order of importance according to their rank. Bodyguards with shields stand close by, and it leads to fights over the best bit of meat and all the rest of it. Um, the drink of choice amongst the wealthy is wine, brought in from Italy, uh, or from south of France, in fact. It's normally drunk unmixed with water, which was regarded as barbarous, basically. Um, civilised people in the Greek and Roman world watered their wine down. Um, most of the population also drinks of plain honeyed beer called korma. So that's mainly about Gaul. There is a bit about Britain. The most civilised of all the nations in Britain are those who live in Kent, and probably that includes all of this area as well in reality, which is an entirely maritime district. They do not differ much from Gallic, or from Gaul, from uh, Gallic customs. Most of the inland inhabitants do not sow corn, but live on milk and flesh and are clothed in skins. This is Caesar not knowing what he's talking about, because he didn't get to the interior himself, and he's relying on hearsay. And it's definitely not the case <laughs> that they didn't grow corn and that they were clothed in skins. All the Britons dye themselves with woad, which gives a bluish colour and a terrifying appearance in battle. They wear their hair long and shave their bodies except the head and upper lip. Ten or a dozen men have wives in common, particularly brothers with brothers and parents with their children. If the wives have any children, they are attributed to the man that they first had intercourse with, which is an interesting <laughs> social structure. Um, now, given that Caesar is definitely wrong about part of what he says just then, could he be wrong about other things as well? That's, that's a big, unanswerable question. Lastly, let's talk about Boudicca. Boudicca, who is a Celtic word meaning victory, so she is the same as Queen Victoria. That's what the word means. A British woman of royal lineage and an uncommonly intelligent woman is a person who was most instrumental in inciting the natives, convincing them to fight the Romans. This uh, Boudicca brought together all her martial forces, approximately 120,000. That done, she climbed up onto a raised platform which had been built of turf in the Roman manner. She was huge of body with a horrific expression and a harsh voice. An immense mass of bright red hair uh, descended to her hips. She wore a large toque of twisted gold and a tunic of many colours over which there was a thick cape fastened by a brooch. She grasped a spear in order to strike fear into all who watched her when she gave a speech. So, um, the Romans were plainly uh, sort of frightened of the Gauls, but not in the sense that their army was easily capable of defeating them. Um, and same goes for Boudicca as well. Okay, next slide, please. Let's rush through to the end. Um, what we also know is from the archaeology is that we can, we can link all these things together. Um, some of the ancient texts talk about headhunting, so we can find skulls which were plainly nailed onto the walls of buildings, as the texts talk about. Um, here in the south of France, near Aix-en-Provence, Entremont, this is a reconstruction of an Iron Age town. It looks very modern, actually, <laughs> interestingly enough. Um, but I need to point out, those are human skulls um, being displayed. Next slide, please. And further north, this is near Clermont-Ferrand in central, central France, we have a big ceremonial feasting site where people went to drink wine out of amphorae um, and uh, un unwatered down, of course, and uh, eat... Uh, mainly pork and that sort of thing, in big feasts and vast numbers of animal bones and all the rest of it being found. And also, next slide please, we have military trophies with arms and armour on them. Occasionally in uh, France you also get uh, 
piles of human bones, which are the prisoners of war who have been executed. But they had a, a different side to them. Next slide, please. Here's a theatre built in the pre-Roman period in Gaul. And there's one in Britain at Colchester, um, which probably goes back to the very late Iron Age as well. Well, the very last thing I want to do, and I'm sorry I might overrun by a couple, few minutes, but let's have a quick look at the coins versus as art. Next slide, please. Well, the coins we've, be, we've looked at, they all seem to have some sort of link with the classical world, with Alexander the Great's coins or um, coins of Romans and all the rest of it. But they have a local thing in them as well, uh, the gods and goddesses, the cosmological interpretation, all the rest of it. Um, what we don't have, for the most part, is what we call Latin art or Celtic art, as we understand it, the, the swirling, curvilinear decoration of the sort that you can see on the end of this. And here, this is the Battersea Shield, and this is the Snettersham Talk. Um, Snettersham Talk is several uh, kilos of gold, and is a wonderful thing. I have actually picked it up, I have to say. <laughs> it's, um, it's in the British Museum. Um, wearing gloves, I hasten to say. Um, and uh, this is what we, roughly speaking, call late Celtic art of the period just before Roman conquest, um, same time as when the coins are being produced. So let's have a look at a few other examples. Uh, next slide, please. Here is the uh, a shield from um, Lincoln, and uh, it's a bronze shield, and it's got... Uh, a bar along the centre to reinforce it and the boss where you hold it on the other side. Um, and this is the decoration and that is a wild boar with very long legs. It's obviously a heraldic symbol of some sort. Uh, next slide, please. This is from, uh, from Wandsworth from out of the River Thames. Uh, absolutely typical. Uh, that's a bird's head and wings and so on. But you can see beautiful example of the curvilinear decoration, which is not exactly what you get on the coins. The coins are slightly different. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a pony cap, but with ho horns on it, um, and it's to make the horse look like a different type of animal, basically, um, and it actually comes from Scotland. Um, next slide, please. Uh, from near, uh, near the Thames at Waterloo, this is uh, the nearest we get to a horned helmet. <laughs> um, again, with the curvilinear decoration, it would have had glass enamel in it here and these rough horns, which were probably added on later. That's a military helmet. Um, and then we have religious deposits. Next slide, please. Like Snettisham, the big talk we've just seen. Um, it comes with several smaller ones. They're all in the British Museum, vast collection, well worth seeing. Um, very, very interesting collection in the Iron Age room of the British Museum. Um, next slide, please. And here is the Snesham talk again. Um, but here are some of the, talk, uh, the deposits at Snesham, which is near um, Kings Lynn in Norfolk. And um, this is what... Uh, the ancient authors referred to as the places where things were deposited, but they weren't allowed to take them away on pain of death. And we've got some. <laughs> um, and uh, Snettersham is the best example in Britain of that going on. Um, the thing that's very characteristic of the end of the Iron Age are what we see on the next slide, which are mirrors. Mirrors come in as a fashionable item. People couldn't see what they looked like unless they looked in a pool of water. Um, and uh, mirrors were coming in at right at the end of the Iron Age. Uh, and they often have geometric curvilinear decoration. Um, here's one in Liverpool Museum. Um, here's one from Devon. And here's one of British manufacture, but found in northern, uh, in the Rhineland at Nijmegen. Um, and these are the backs of the mirrors, of course. Uh, and they're often buried, not necessarily with female burials, um, but they are uh, 
But again, if we look at it, the, the decoration on the coins is not like that. Um, and indeed, uh, it's mainly on metalwork, but even stone, next slide please, uh, is, has this wonderful Latin style, so-called curvilinear decoration. This is in Ireland, and it's probably a boundary stone, still in its original position, roughly speaking, uh, with this decoration on it. Um, there's not a lot of this type of Iron Age um, evidence from Ireland, so it's really very interesting. Okay, and the last slide, thank you. Um, let's try to draw this. I've, I've said an awful lot about an awful lot of different things. Um, and uh, uh, I've tried to put the hoard in context of who was using the coins. Well, not those people who are regarded as almost like slaves, that's for sure. It's those two classes that Julius Caesar talks about, the Druids, who may be making religious deposits, and the um, warriors on horses, so as Julius Caesar refers to them, the warrior elite, the people who actually ran the politics and that sort of thing. Um, so they are the people who had these coins. Um, they are the people who may have deposited them uh, as uh, maybe a religious or uh, votive offering or something like that, but maybe for economic purposes, we don't know. The other things to say are, well, I've said it already, but the St. Barb hoard is to have one, a complete Iron Age hoard, or in fact two hoards, of course, um, in a museum, uh, fully on display, is a rare thing. Um, so we're very privileged to have it, and we're very grateful to uh, the uh, arrangements and the, the were made with the metal detectorists, with the portable antiquities schema and a whole host of other people that got, and donations, of course, by many people, that enabled this hoard to get on display. Um, a lot of other hoards, like a Brystone hoard on the Isle of Wight, uh, there's another hoard from Nursling or near Nursling, and they've all disappeared into the antiquities trade. We know sort of what was in them, and, so, and there are photographs of the coins, but that's it. We don't have the coins themselves anymore because they are in round the world, basically, scattered. The coins can tell us a lot about life, about religion, about economics, about uh, tribal or uh, people of, of the affiliation of peoples um, and their links with each other and all that sort of thing. Um, but of course, it's not the whole story. They, there's a whole lot of other things from the ancient sources, from the archaeology, and all the rest of it. And what I went, uh, you know, went into right at the very end, are they art? Well, art's in the eye of a beholder in many respects. When you go over to a museum and look at these coins, some of them are tiny <laughs> and are really difficult to see. Um, and they must have been difficult for people at the time to see as well. So um, it's... Maybe the act of making them was important, just as important as uh, their, their usage. So um, I think they're art. I think they tell us a lot about life in the Iron Age. Um, I think they're probably Celtic uh, in the general sense, as I think is the place named Lymington. <laughs> That's an interesting one, takeaway from tonight, perhaps for many of you. Um, so uh, with that, I'll stop and uh, say thank you very much. Tony, thank you very much for bringing our hoard to life and putting it in the context of, we're very fortunate to have it. Um, are there any questions for Tony? There's a microphone coming down. Sorry, it's probably a silly question, but were they pressed or...? They're, they're struck. What they do is they cast a blank um, in, so that you get a little um, rounded pellet of about approximately the right size and weight, and then uh, they have a, one design on a, what's called an anvil, and then they have a punch on for the other side of the design, and they put the, the pellet of metal in between, and they hit it hard with a hammer, and 
hopefully the design comes out properly on both sides of the coin. Um, they're not cast. Cast coins, if you see a cast Iron Age coin, it's a forgery, <laughs> of which there are quite a few. <laughs> There's one down. Um, you mentioned that the coins are made of gold, if I've heard that right. Yes, Where yes. does the gold come from? Yes, that's a very interesting question. Um, there's, a, in, in the hoard of a rope, by the way, there's only one gold coin and all the others are silver. That's mainly because the Diotrico is mainly used silver. But having said that, um, the gold is probably coming from places like Ireland, Ireland was a good source of gold from the Bronze Age onwards. And there's quite a lot of gold jewellery and that sort of thing um, going right back into the second millennium BC. So they're probably recycling it, of course, and probably melting it down, um, as, of course, happens today. Um, and uh, uh, that, that's very likely where the gold comes from. It's, it obviously is not... And gold coins from this area are not mined in this area at all. They have to get the gold from somewhere else. This one here. Hi, Tony. Um, I just, on that gold sourcing point, I was wondering whether there had been any chemical analysis of the coins to look at the percentage of gold in them. And whether, I guess that falls in line with function versus yeah. art as well. But the, the analysis of coins, but there has been quite a lot of analysis. These particular coins in the St. Bob Museum have not been analysed for um, metal content and whether they've, uh, you know, we're of a 99% pure or whatever. I do know from having seen quite a few Iron Age gold coins is that they do vary from the very bright yellow, shiny gold to something which is much duller. And you can get electrum as well, which is a, a combination usually of silver and gold together. Um, so there's quite a lot of variation. And that does imply that probably a melting other things down to create the coins. It's fascinating to hear you say they made the coins with a die and an anvil. How did they make the die and the anvil? And what was it made of? <laughs> They are, we don't know for the Iron Age for sure, but Roman coinage and Greek coinage, we do have the anvils and the dyes and all the rest of it um, surviving, and they tend to be iron, um, but you do get bronze ones as well. But obviously bronze is a bit soft, um, and uh, you, you, it's iron that is mainly the thing that's used. We don't use stone. Um, well, they have to grind it to create the design. Hence, the sort of little dots and lines and that sort of thing. Um, uh, what these coins do look like are like ancient gems. Ancient gems often had designs on them. They're called intaglios. Um, and they had a similar way of doing it. Occasionally, they used wheels but mainly it must have been by little chisels and grinders and that sort of thing, using sand and, and so on. But I, 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 I'm not 100% on top of that as a, as, a, as a subject, so you know, there, there may be other, other things to say about that, let's be honest. Some, yes. <clears throat> Was the value of the coin indicated by the designs on them, or was it just by weight, or what? I think, it, I think it almost certainly was by weight. Um, you get what things called, uh, which we call staters, whether they called them staters or not, we don't know. They tend to be quite large. But you also get half staters and quarter staters, which are roughly speaking, um, you know, fractions of the, of the full size ones. Um, and there must have been a relationship between gold, silver, and bronze. There are some bronze coins, but not that many. Um, and uh, certainly the Romans uh, and the Greeks had a, tri a bimetallic or a trimetallic scheme which related everything together. Uh, so that there were uh, 10 bronze coins in one silver coin, 
all that sort of thing. Um, now, whether the Iron Age people did, did that, they probably tried to copy the, the uh, moneying scheme of the Romans, maybe. Um, but equally, as I said, it's quite difficult to actually buy one, and it, uh, sort of buy something cheap with an Iron Age coin, because there's no change. You know, they're only the valuable coins for the most part. Um, and therefore, uh, it, it may have been much more um, in terms of weighing and counting, um, uh, mainly weighing and that sort of thing. And of course, that gets us back to the Bible and the money chamber changes in the temple. It's the sort of thing that goes on right across the ancient world, where they had to weigh the coins to make sure that they were uh, full size and full, full value. In the back row, yes. Was it buried or was it dropped? And how deep was it buried? Oh, the hoard, um, yes, I, I think it almost certainly would have been buried, deliberately dug into the ground. Why do you think the coins didn't have traditional Celtic designs on them? <laughs> I think your guess is as good as mine in, in some respects. Clearly, the coins had a tradition of their own as to what designs they had on them. And so the ultimate origin of some of the designs goes back to Philip II of Macedon and Alexander the Great, who, of course, are not Celts by any stretch of the imagination. They're from northern Greece. Um, and uh, the designs quite clearly maintained an aspect of, of copying those designs. So there's, there's a traditional customary element. Um, and, of, of course, that is not the curvilinear stuff which is a slight, it, it tends to develop in relationship to things like swords and the torques that we've seen, the neck rings and bracelets and that sort of thing. Hello. Yep, sorry. Um, how, much, uh, co how many coins were found in the two hordes that make our hoard? How does that compare with some of the other hordes? And, so, and if... If it's the feeling that it's a religious um, offering, does the size of the hoard indicate or not the, sort of the, um, the worth of that religious site? That's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, let's answer the last one first. Probably, probably not. It may well be the case that the, the, um, there are individual deposits which are taking place in one location over a period of time. Uh, in the end, they'd add up to quite a lot. Um, in other places, like, say, Hailing Island, there are at least a 1,000 coins from Hailing Island, um, and uh, they are scattered over a square kilometre, but not just in one place. Um, the hoard in, in the museum here is about 270 coins, roughly speaking. Uh, the Brystone hoard was 990. Um, the lost hoard from near Nursling was approximately 3,000. The biggest hoard known is at least 60,000 coins, and it's from Jersey. So uh, ours is small but beautiful. <laughs> uh, a very good note on which to end, and I'd like to thank you very much, Tony backed by popular demand, and um, we look forward to another trip perhaps next year through the history of uh, our region. But thank you, and uh, we appreciate it. <laughs> so can I just remind you that the next talk is on Friday the 3rd of February at 6 o'clock. Um, and the speaker will be Anne Desmet, who is a Royal Academician. Um, she's a wood engraver, and she's created the exhibition, which will be in the museum, uh, called Seen Through Wood, which is coming from the Ashmolean in Oxford. Um, so do come and listen to Anne Desmet next month, 
at six o'clock. And uh, I wish you all a safe uh, trip home. <laughs>